Welcome, everybody. What's up, so y'all? fun to see you guys. Let's see. We'll give you guys some time to jump in here. We've got Jeff and Cindy. So good to see you. Frank, so good to see you, Frank. I love it. Lindsay's here. Lots of, lots of people that we, we love to see your name, recognize. We, I just wish now we could see your faces. Ginny, so good to see you on here always. It's awesome. All right. We, we'll give you guys a couple minutes to get in, um, but we'll, we'll kind of get started and just welcome you in, let you know kind of what to expect, what's, gonna, what's going on this evening. We're excited to have you here. We're excited to have you guys engage in the chat, ask questions. We do obviously want to hear from you. So don't hesitate. If you have any questions, feel free to put those in the Q&A. That is what I'm going to be going off of. That's what I'm going to make sure that we, we get these questions answered. So obviously keep, keep being engaged in the chat, talk to each other, talk to us. We love to see you on here. But if you have any questions that you're looking to have answered, put those in the Q&A area and we can make sure to get those. Um, as you guys can see, we have Tyler here, Tyler Devro. We're super yeah. excited to have Ty here. He's going to be going over passive due diligence or due diligence for passive investors, however you want to look at it. There, there's a lot to go over. So it looks like we, we're slowly dripping in. So I'm going to give you guys a couple minutes. Um, we do have a couple people here to, to make sure that everybody gets taken care of, but just a quick laundry list. It, make sure to stay muted so that we can, we can make sure that this, this webinar doesn't have any extra curveballs. But also, um, we, we are going to keep this meeting at 30 minutes. So there's a lot of information to go over. If you feel like it's overwhelming, it's all right. That's why we're here. We're going to get you guys taken care of. So I, Ty, are you okay if I dive in and introduce you? Yeah, for sure. I love how you just right out the gate, you're like, she passively just told me to keep it at 30 minutes. I caught that. I caught that. <laughs> but I love it. I'm in. I'm ready. We'll, we'll do it. Listen, so. I just see John in here and he's hungry. I can, I can see it through the camera. He needs his dinner. So <laughs> 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 no, we, I'm going to introduce Tyler to you guys. I know that a lot of you already know who that is, but we're extremely excited to have Tyler here presenting. We're lucky. Tyler is actually one of the top educators in the, in the multifamily industry. He travels all over the United States talking to investors just like you and teaching you really what to look for. So you're in the right place. He manages as the managing partner at MF Capital Partner. At, he manages a little over 2,200 units across six different states. And that equates to about 230 million um, in his portfolio. So he's a wealth of knowledge and we're, we're excited to have him. And I don't know if you guys can see the resemblance, but I'm the much better looking much more, you know, funny, much more, much more hilarious sister of Tyler. <laughs> so <laughs> nah, I don't, you know what? That was a courtesy laugh. I ain't gonna lie. I didn't like that joke at all. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. So I'm ready. Absolutely. Thank you for that intro, man. You know what? I, I always love webinars because it makes Melissa, she has to be nice for the intro. And you know what, as a, as a sibling, that doesn't happen too often, but on the intros, it happens. And so, you know what, I record those, I store those, and I <laughs> listen to them when she's not being so nice. So, well, hey, so good to have like everybody vinegar. on here. <laughs> so good to have everybody on here. I'm going to, you know, dive in. And I'm excited to dive into this topic, man. I'll tell you right now that this topic is, gosh damn it, it's so important. Okay, so here's my first question. Have any of you ever... And write it in the chat. I think I can see, yeah, I can see the chat right here. Okay. Write in the chat if you've ever invested passively into, dude, anything, real estate, stocks, whatever, any passive investments before, give me a thumbs up, a thumbs down, a, whatever you want to. Middle finger emoji if that's available. Gene, what's <laughs> up, dude? Good to see you. Lots of yeses. Okay, sweet. Okay. So for those individuals who have invested, have you ever lost money before? Give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Good. A little bit. Yes. 
Okay, have you ever? Robert I love the, cry, the crying emoji. <laughs> I know, Robert, good to see you on here too, man. Shay, no, okay, now those, good to see Shay on here as well. Okay, those of you who, have you ever made money through your passive investments? I hope to see some massive thumbs up in there. And if you haven't lost money, I'd imagine, there we go. Okay, <laughs> lots of money, good. Okay, so now here's my question. If those of you who have lost money uh, or didn't even make money, because listen, some of you may have broken even, but you, you, know, you don't account for inflation, and which means you actually lost money. So those of you who have done that, what, what emotion sticks with you longer, making money or losing money? Type it in, making or losing. <laughs> yeah, losing, losing. That's a, it's just a fact. It's like we have this w way more of an emotional pull, you know, towards risk aversion, right? L losing than we do towards winning. So how do we reduce our chance of losing and increase our chance of winning? Dude, it's due diligence. It's due diligence. So today is not a passive it might be you know, due diligence for passive investors, but it's not a passive topic, okay? I want you to have notes out. I want you to be taking some notes. I'm gonna give you some questions that you can ask. Uh, these you know, different operators and everybody that you're going through, I'll kind of give you a, a rundown also of the different topics that we'll be covering. You'll see that it says part one, and that means that there's more parts than just one. I'm gonna go through a brief overview, and then I'm gonna go through part one, and then, uh, you know, it's a, a series. It's actually a four-part series that we're going to walk you all through. So a couple housekeeping items. Melissa mentioned most of it, but any um, questions, go ahead and throw it in the Q&A. And it helps to throw it in the Q&A because then we can check them off and we know that it's been answered. Uh, you can, you know, throw any comments or anything in the chat, whatever you would like to. Um, also, how to contact the team. We have our team on here. Uh, and those of you who don't know, I mean, it looks like I know most everybody on the call. I know a lot of y'all on the call. Um, but multifamily capital partners have been investing now in multifamily for uh, a little while and very grateful for the space, you know, and very grateful for the team that I have, you know, Melissa and Tasha, they are, um, they, they oversee investor relations. We have, um, uh, Brian on here as well. Ryan is the co-founder managing partner of multifamily capital partners. He'll be in there answering questions on there as well, but we got a whole grip of team members. Uh, for you to tap into and for us to utilize on these projects. So if you have questions uh, and then you want to, you know, maybe even questions about what we're going to talk about, certainly we can ask today. Questions you want to reach out and ask us individually, uh, you can certainly do that. Melissa, I'm going to hurry and ask you, what is the, do you have a link or what is the best way for them to get a hold of y'all? Yep. So we have a Calendly link. That seems to be the easiest way then you guys aren't trying to, to figure out what's best for our candle, calendar. It's easy for you guys to just go in and, and make whatever works for you. So Tasha, Tasha will be able to drop that link for you guys. Sweet. You can click on that link, you know, schedule an appointment, whatever you would like to. Um, investment opportunities as well. We always, obviously always have investment opportunities for you to do due diligence on and make a decision. Uh, so those of you who would like to, those of you who are already not on our passive investor list, or those of you who have not uh, looked into our new fund, do you have that link too? I should have asked mm -hmm. this before. Yeah, we okay, do. Wait. I just figured, I just knew you would. So we can drop that what link do you in want? the chat to everybody. We got well. it. <laughs> good, good, good answer. So we'll drop that in there as well so you know where to go. Okay, so today's topic, we're going to talk about, once again, due diligence for passive investors. I'm going to tell you right now that there is... Um, I'll let, wait for Jackson to scan it over. There is so much to look at, okay? There's just a ton, man, to look at. Like management team, the cash on cash return. What, what are the, you know, exit caps? What's the entry cap rate? What are the sales price going to be? Is that, you know, even aggressive, conservative? How do they structure the deal? There is just a ton. I mean, literally a ton. So my question for you is this. What is the number one thing to look at, do you think? What is the number one thing to look at? You can throw it in there if you have any guesses, maybe even just be, you know what, be thinking. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to be thinking of these two questions. Number one, what is the most important thing to look at? 
there's a ton. We cannot look at everything. It would be awesome if we can, but I mean, my goodness, there's a lot to go through, right? It's our job. I'll tell you right now as operators, it is our job to look at freaking every nook and cranny, but as a passive investor, you also need to do due diligence, but it's like, what makes sense, right? Uh, the other side, the other question that I would ask is what is the number one risk of any passive investment? Passive real estate investment, passive investment. What is the number one risk? So those two questions, what's the number one thing to look at? Well, I, in my opinion, it would be whatever poses the number one risk to any passive real estate investment. And I got a couple uh, comments in the chat of what you think those are, and we're going to go through them. But I'll tell you this too, not knowing the answers to those questions or not knowing what, even that those are even the question to ask, I believe it stops most people from for achieving their goals first off. So it stops them from even investing but then it stops them from really just achieving their investment goals because either they don't, in, don't invest or they don't ask the right questions and they invest in something that is uh, not the best idea to invest in for their goals, their, you know, their criteria and what they're looking for. So we have to be able to ask those. And I'll tell you, have any of y'all ever, I live out here in Maui. And by the way, our AC went out in the, the office, the office that the building that we're in our office, the whole AC went out for the whole building. And so if it looks like I'm sweating off my bald head here, I know I did not grease my head. I should probably grease my head. I actually kind of like that reflection. Uh, yeah, I, it is hotter than Hades in here. So <laughs> bear with me as we go through this. But hey, wait, live Tyler, out here in Maui. Is, is Haiti plural or is it just hotter than Haiti? Uh, shit. It's I think it's just Haiti. You know what? I haven't went down that route. That's gosh. <laughs> Whew, that's a good question to ask. Good, you know what? We'll topic for another day. I'll do some due diligence <laughs> on that and let y'all know. Um, but one of my favorite hikes out here in Maui is called the Four Falls of Nahili Hili. It is, uh, it's just an amazing hike. It's, you go through this, it's on the road to Hana. Have y'all ever been out to Maui? Maybe throw that in the chat. Have you been to Maui? Give me a yes, no. Have, and, and if so, have you done Road to Hana as well? In Road to Maui, on, on in Maui. Joe, yes, hey Joe, we did this hike together, part of this hike together. Okay. Okay. So one of my favorite hikes, once again, four, four, four falls of Nihili Hili. And it is obviously it goes to four waterfalls. Okay. The name kind of gives it away, but you hike through this bamboo forest. And then you get to this waterfall, then you climb up this kind of like this rock face. You have to use like a rope to get up. And then you climb across the edge. It's kind of, you know, there's a river right here. And then you get to a rope swing. And then you climb up this rickety ass ladder. It's super sketchy, very dangerous, uh, but whatever. You climb up and then there's another waterfall. And then you have to jump in. You can't continue to hike. You have to jump in and swim and then climb to the last waterfall. Now, it is amazing. It is an amazing hike. And the full thing to go, uh, you know, up and back about two hours, okay? Well, I have my nephew in town and uh, his uh, girlfriend, his name's Corbin and her, her name's Piper. And, you know, they're like, hey, what should we do? And I'm like, dude, you should go on the four falls of Nahili Hili. Not even a question. It's a phenomenal hike. You'll absolutely love it. It'll be the highlight of your trip. And so they're like, and I'm like, okay, here's the map. Here, here's where you go. Here's where you stop. Drop a pin. Now, here's the trail that walks you through the whole, like literally it GPSs you through the whole, so you know that where you're going, right? This, and I'm just walking them through it. Gave them as much info as I, well, as I possibly could, okay? But I could not go on the hike with them, probably because I was doing something to service you as investors on some of our deals. I don't know, okay? But probably, because you guys are all I ever focus on. That's a fact, okay? <laughs> but I couldn't go. And so they go and they come back and I'm like, Hey, how was the hike? And they're like, Oh man, it was, it was good. Yeah, it was, it was a decent hike. I'm like, did, so did you make it the last waterfall? Cause listen, the magic is that last waterfall, huge, beautiful waterfall. And they're like, no, you know, we, no, we, I, I think, I, I think, I think so. You know, it took us quite a while to get to like, you know, the rope swing part. I'm like, yeah, it took us quite a while to get there. How long? Two hours, two hours just to get to the rope swing. That's the first part of the damn hike. So I was like, okay, what, what in the world, right? And then they didn't make it to the top. 
why didn't they make it to the top and why did it take them so long? Because they did not have confidence in where they were going. They didn't know that they were going the right way. The whole time they're second guessing themselves. The whole time they're wondering, is this the way to go through this bamboo forest height, right? So they're, is it right or left? Is it straight or back? Is it this way or this way? What, which way to go, right? The whole time, the whole time. Then they get to the point where, you know, we're talking about return on investment, where you're going to get the return on your investment. And what do they do? They retreat and head back. The result is a very average hike. Okay, compare that to my first time going on that hike with somebody who knew the hike. They had done the hike. They walked with confidence. I had somebody walking me through that with confidence. We knew exactly where to go. Why? Because I just followed them. And I knew, hey, we're going to stop here. This is what we're going to do. We're going to jump in. Great. Then we go to the here. Okay, we're going to jump in. You know, rope swing. We're going to do a backflip here. That's great. Okay, now jump back out. We're going to climb the ladder. You sure it's safe? Okay, you stay. Okay, safe. Seem confident. I'm going to go. Boom. And we make it to this top waterfall. And it's literally my favorite hike that I've ever done in my entire life. Not just in Maui, in my entire life. What a different outcome, right? So what, what's the point? Why do I tell you that story? Well, the point is, man, walking with confidence makes all the difference. Walking with confidence makes all the difference. And we need to be able to walk with confidence as passive investors. We also need to be able to make sure that those we're investing with are walking with confidence. So how do we do that, though, as passive investors? How do we walk with confidence as passive investors? That's the question that we need to answer tonight, okay? So back to the topic, okay? It's gonna be the six key areas to focus on, six key areas of due diligence to focus on uh, with passive investing. What do, we, what do we ask, right? And, there's, and this is what I want you to write down. Write down these notes. This is what we're not gonna, we're not gonna cover all these tonight. We're gonna cover one of these, but once again, a four-part series, but you need to be able to answer all of these, okay? And look into all of these. So number one, the operating partners. Okay, I learned this the hard way on my first deal. So what, what are these areas, these buckets, if you will, that we need to look into? Number one is the operating partners. And I'll tell you that that one I looked at, like that one I, I just, I learned the hard way on my very first passive investment deal. Number two is the investment strategy of the deal. The investment strategy. There's four basic strategies when it comes to multifamily investing and we need to understand the risks and the returns of all four of those for example a major reposition okay a major reposition you can certainly make a good chunk of money high returns with a major reposition but it's also a very high risk investment and it wouldn't be a good fit for say an investor that has immediately uh, immediate liquidity needs because that deal you're going to have to take time to reposition that just means rehab get everything the, the deal going uh stabilize the deal, then drive values. So if you need immediate cash flow needs, you, is that one of your needs? Well, then that's not going to be a good investment strategy for you because that deal won't see cash flow for a year, probably maybe even two. So what is it? Okay. What is their investment strategy of the deal? Number three, the investment market. The investment market is very, very important as well. Now I got trained in that topic and you know, Ryan and I both did right out the gates of how important that is. There are, to simplify it, there's six economic factors that we look into anytime that we go into a market. So, so number three, what is the investment market? We're looking at these six economic factors and we need, and what, what is the factor? Is that good or bad, right? We'll talk about those two. Number four is the financial breakdown. Number four is the financial breakdown of the deal. Uh, obviously important or the financial breakdown of the investment, right? So what are their underwriting projections? You know, what are the debt details that they're putting into the deal? What are the exit projections? What are the return projections? What's the return analysis? Is it conservative? Is it aggressive? The financial breakdown is number four, the financial breakdown. Number five is alignment of values. And this is so important in my opinion, you know, a lot of times we don't look at values when we look at a passive investment, but listen, where we invest our money has the potential to impact the, the world far beyond ourselves. And for me, and I would imagine for all of y'all, it's crucial to know who I'm partnering with and what their values are and that they have the same vision and desire to focus on more than just revenue. This business, any business that I ever do will never just be about dollars and cents ever. It'll be about the values, the impact that we're making. So number five is alignment of values. What are their values? What are, what, what are those things, right? Uh, number six is risk tolerance. 
Number six is risk tolerance. Each investment strategy, investment market, investment, each investment has different pros and cons and different risk levels. So everyone has, and everyone has a different idea of what risk is too, by the way. So some people look for the highest returns regardless of the risk. Well, there's operators that you know think that same way. So those are the six things. I'm gonna review them real quick just in case you missed one, okay? Number one, the operating partners, the management team, if you will. Number two is the investment strategy of the deal. Number three is the investment market, the investment market. Number four, the financial breakdown. And number five, um, alignment of values is number five. And then number six is risk tolerance. Okay. All right. So, so back okay, to our question that we- Before yeah. you jump into that, how do you know these six things? Because going off of that first slide where you showed us all of that plethora of issues, how did you get to this point to know what six areas to focus on? Because I've lost money. Because <laughs> I've lost money. Listen, being a passive investor has made me a way better active investor, Me meaning an operator on a deal. Being the operator on a deal has obviously made me a far better passive investor. I passively invest. First off, we, we as a group, as a company, we passively invest. I, as an individual, passively invest in every single deal we do as well, every deal. And how do I know that these are the, the, the six things? Well, because I'm an active investor in 2,000 plus units and you know an operator on 2,000 plus units. I own 2,000 plus units and I know what those risk factors are because I analyze those, look at those, um, think about those, dream about those every day, every night, man, every day and every, and every night. So hopefully that asks, answers that question. But as you go back to you know, that first initial question that we posed, which is what is the number one risk? It's the management team, it's your operating partners. And that's what we're gonna cover today. That's what we're gonna cover today. That management team, we need to make sure that they can walk with confidence, that when they're, what they're doing on this, well, for hell's sakes, I didn't put the slide to continue to repeat. So it's just gonna be a blank slide. Just zoom in on me, Jay, just zoom in on me. I messed up the slide. <laughs> Should have done due diligence. No, not that far. That's too much. <laughs> Should have done due diligence on my, on my transitions here. <laughs> so my very first passive investment, I learned about the multifamily space, okay? And I'm so pumped about it because I did not know that it was possible to invest in apartments. I had no clue. Uh, so, and I'm literally, I'm so excited. I had some single family properties and I'm very excited to invest passively and actively, but passively into multifamily investments. And so what do I do? I dive headfirst in. And first, I'm not kidding you. When I say the first passive investment opportunity that was sent my way, I invested my hard earned capital into that deal and did zero due diligence. Zero due diligence. The only due diligence I did is that it was a real deal. Great. It wasn't a scam. Okay, great. But I had no idea what questions to ask. So what, that, what happened is it was a fairly decent deal and it was a fairly... It was even a fairly decent market, like these things that we talked about, right? Their strategies were pretty decent, but um, it was with some fairly horrendous operators, which left me in this deal that the real estate market is booming. This is 2014, 2015. Real estate market is booming. And my investment was a bust. Why? Not because of the deal, not because of the market, is and not even because of their strategy. It was because of the op operators and their inability to execute their business strategy. The operators are the number one. This is when I learned this. Man. I, knew, I knew that day that the operators that day, that span of time, but I knew very quickly after that investment that the operators are the number one factor of deal performance. The number one. They're going to be the number one factor of risk or return in your investment. So you need to be able to vet them. And I'm going to give you questions to ask, okay? There's going to be curveballs on every single deal, every deal. That's a fact. That's not a question. That's not a, you know, that's not a, that's a fact. So the operators have to be experienced enough and dedicated and dedicated enough. That's another thing, dedicated enough to handle it. So, and then I'll come in with some of our questions on how we know that, okay? And I'm not saying, I'm not saying that, you know, a strong operator can make any deal work. Real estate is a risk. I need to always clarify this. Real estate's a risk but it is your operator's job to mitigate 
that risk and maximize returns. The operator is just as important, if not more important than the deal itself. And in my opinion, uh, more important. We've had curveballs on a number of deals. And a number of you have been on those investments where we've had curveballs on. We've had fires on properties where whole buildings have burnt down. Whole buildings, Cra crazy stuff, right? And we have to go in, we have to fix the problem. Uh, we've had quarantine orders, eviction moratoriums that we've had to navigate. We can't evict, we can't, you know, everyone is, is being told that they can't uh, or that they don't need to pay rent. That's all on the same property that I'm talking about, by the way. We bought a property at the end of January, 1st of February of uh, the closing date was right around there of 2020, right after was uh, coronavirus, quarantine, big old fire. We have to navigate all those waters. And the strategy, our investment strategy was we had to evict slow non-paying tenants and improve the community. And all of a sudden we couldn't evict. But do you know what? We were very dedicated to the cause. We found ways to evict. We found ways to in, you know, appeal to human needs to get those people out, get more, better people in, take care of the fire situation. And uh, it's a profitable investment in Village East that we're about to exit. We have another one, Prosper Fairways. Prosper Fairways is in Columbia, South Carolina. That property is a great property, man. It's an awesome property. But um, the neighbor property, what we did not realize is massive massive drug, uh, not on our property, but on that property, massive amounts of drug dealers, drug activity, massive amounts, so much that there was a span there where there was some gang activity and people were getting shot in that area and coming over onto our property and they died on our property after being shot in a drug war. That's no joke. How do you handle something like that? How do you manage 400 plus tenants, more than that, 400 units? So a lot more tenants than 400. How do you manage that? How do you take care of them? How do you make sure that you can instill confidence to make sure that the deal performs? It's dedication to solutions. And that deal we're about to exit as well, massive, massive returns. So we have to be able to understand how to vet the right operating partners, what questions to ask, and are they going to do that? Or are they going to uh, not do that? You know, cash in and go on the four falls in the Healy Healy when we need to deal with drug dealers in Columbia, South Carolina. Which one are they going to choose, damn it? We need to know. Okay. So, some questions that you need to ask. Okay. Here's some questions. You can write these down. Snap a Jay, you can show the slide if you want to. Uh, so, you write them down, snap a picture of the, the screen, whatever you would like to do. But some questions we need to ask. This may seem very, very basic, but have they done this before? You would think that that would be the first question that any of us would ask, but I didn't even ask that question. I just assumed that they had done this before. It's a bad assumption, bad assumption. Uh, have they done this before? Now, the individuals that I first invested with, they had done it before. They just had not done it very well, which comes into number four question, which what's the track record on those deals? So number one though, have they done it before? Number two, what is their background? Now, this is important to me, Kate. Have they done it before is important. I want to know that. But I want to know their background. What, I, what I'm asking here, what I'm trying to figure out here is, okay, does it have to do with real estate? Sure, that's a pro. That's an upside, right? But I also want to know what have they done? And listen to me when I say this. What have they done that has helped, that, that has taken dedication for them to achieve a goal? What have they done? Are they, you know, Gene, you're on here. I'll point, Gene's a pilot. I know that to become a pilot, you have to go to school. You have to have tons of hours of training. I don't know how many hours, Gene, maybe put it in the, in the uh, chat, let me know. But tons of hours before you can become a pilot. Why? Well, because he's gonna fly us to our destination, man. 2,000 hours, easy, he says, 2,000 hours because he's going to fly us to our destination. I, how many of you want to go fly with a pilot that has two hours? Not I, not me. No, out. But that's what I did on my first passive investment. You know, they did not have very many hours operating. So what's their background though? And, and have they done things that have, that show that they can dedicate themselves to something? I need to know those kind of things. Number three, how many deals as a partnership do they own? Uh, I don't know how many of you are business owners on here or, you know, we can look at partnerships in a number of different ways. You can look at partnerships as, you know, business partnerships. 
It could be your relationships. Okay, how have those been? How this partnership that's together, they're gonna operate this deal as a team together. How do they operate together? How are they, right? Who's in the, Jackson, who's in the playoffs right now? The Suns, right? There we go. Phoenix, I, I, I don't Whoa. watch too much sports out here. Why didn't you ask me that I, question? I don't know if I want to go down that rabbit hole, Melissa. <laughs> no, the Phoenix Suns, I, there's a number of them, right? There's still a few teams playing. So the Phoenix Suns obviously have a better system right now, operating system right now, than those teams who are no longer around, right? So once again, what have they done? And as a partnership, how many deals do they have together? How long have they been together? And then number four, what are the track record on those deals that they've done together? What's their track record? And I want, I, I want to know, those things are so, once again, those seem like basic questions, but you should be able to rattle off the answers to those questions. Uh, they should, sorry, the operator should be able to rattle off the answers to those questions right away and give you clear cut answers. I almost look at it the same as hiring, you know, like when I'm going to hire team members, hire employees for any of the businesses that we have, it's yes, skills are important. Yes, the skill in that, that area is very important, um, but it's not the end all be all for me. I'll tell you what the end all be all for me is. It's cu cultures is the number one priority when we're hiring for any, any of our companies. And the two major companies is our education company, multifamily mindset, our investment company, multifamily capital partner, partners. It's the culture. Who are these people? What are their, who are they, right? What have they done? What's their stick to itiveness? One of the questions that I'll ask employees, for an example. Okay, say that you're late to, late to uh, your sister's wedding and uh, you need to get a gift and you forgot to get a gift. So you stop and you go get that gift. But as you're walking out, remember you're late, but as you're walking out, you see that there's a shopping cart, stray shopping cart right in the middle of the parking lot. What do you do? My answer to that question, or th their answer to that question will tell me a lot. Do they take the extra five seconds to go put it away, go the extra mile, or they ignore it like 99% of people do? I want those people who are gonna go the extra mile because if they do that, they're gonna go the extra mile on everything. It's who they are, their character, exactly. It's their character. So who are they, okay? Okay, those are the, the first four. The next ones, number five, how many deals do they have in the current target market? It's also important, okay? We have, and do they have deals in multiple markets is another one. Like, for example, okay? We have, we have um, hundreds of units in multiple markets. We, we have hundreds of units in six different markets. Being able to do that and operate those at a, at a level that actually is, uh, you know, that we perform, you have systems. What are those systems in place? What are those operating systems in place? So I want to know how many deals do they have in that market? Who is their team within that market? I want to hear their answer to that kind of stuff. Number six, is it their full-time focus or a part-time focus? Is it a full-time or a part-time focus? Once again, I want somebody that's full-time because you want to know why? Because when it comes down to fires, you know, uh, people dying on your property, I need somebody that's full-time there. That's a fact. Not just one person, two, a team of people. There is zero chance that any of these problems that we have on properties, which they happen. Once again, curveball is going to happen on every deal. That's not, that's not the problem. The problem is how we react to it, right? I, I, I believe that the event plus our response equals the outcome. It's never the event that equals the outcome. It's our response to that event that equals the outcome. Okay, what have their responses been? And if they are part-time, the ability to have a good response and truly clearly think through that response and have a team to execute the game plan, the vision there is very slim. What is it? Are they full-time? Are they part-time? Number seven, who is the property management company they're using? Who is that property management company that they're using? Or, or maybe they are the property management company. Maybe they, uh, you know, have a scarcity mentality and they would rather manage the deal on their own than hire a professional company with professional systems to manage it. Now, that doesn't mean number seven is, or sorry, number eight is, goes right in line with this, who will oversee the property management company. 
because I'll tell you right now, if I ever hear any operator tell me that they've lost a deal or struggled in a deal or whatever it was because of the property management company, str struggling is one thing because there are things that cause struggle. But if they've ever underperformed because of that, well, I'm just going to tell you right now, that's their fault. We had to, for an example, we had to fire and on a big property, you know, these big properties, when when you have to fire a property management company, it is literally like a hostile takeover. And I, you know, it's not something that I could do. I'm already five minutes behind from you know, Melissa's uh, timeline and I'm close, Melissa, I swear. But it's not something I can walk you through here, but I'm gonna tell you it's a hostile takeover and it's one that needs to be done with um, a lot of focus and a lot of guidance, that's for sure. And uh, if they're part-time, first off, they're not gonna be able to do that. And what we did, we had to fire it, not only just one property, over four different properties because that property management company, actually five properties, sorry, because that property management company was underperforming. And then what happens? We turn that property around and get massive returns on the back end. Why? Because we solved the problem. So is there somebody boots on the ground to recognize those problems, to identify those problems, to visit the property regularly? Is there somebody there to do that? Have we ever worked with the property management company before? If so, what are your systems with them? What, what do you check with them? How do you check if they're performing? Because if you're only checking things monthly, so here's your answer. What are your systems? If they're only checking things monthly or quarterly, no, no, no. We need, if we're going to be able to, the best way to stop a problem is to stop it before it even becomes a problem. You know how you do that? You track it weekly at a minimum, weekly. Every single week, what are these key metrics? Do they know what the key metrics are? How do they track them? What do they do, right? We need to know those kind of things. So that's number eight. Number, oh my gosh, and I, I think that I combined them and then I didn't change the slide to combine them. Goodness gracious. Number nine is a mystery. I ain't even gonna tell you what it is until the next webinar. Yep, until the next webinar, which means you better register for the next webinar. <laughs> okay, number 10. Number 10 is what have they projected? What returns have they projected? And what have they actually hit? It's a very, very important thing to ask. What are their return projections? Because projections, speculation, I mean, yeah, optimism is a great thing, but there's a lot that can wipe out optimism, right? Over the span of a three, five year hold. What's the difference between learning from you versus going with, <laughs> if you can kindly educate, please. I shouldn't have read that one out loud. Um, a lot, but this is for a passive investors here. So this is passively investing, um, but there's a lot difference. You know, I don't know a ton about that individual's program. I definitely know of that individual and I'm sure that he has great stuff. And I'm, you know, we have great stuff with our education program, but you know how you find that? You do some due diligence. And I promise you, if you give us a call, we'll walk you through what we do, and then you can compare for sure. So you can compare. The tipping, port, the tipping point for my friend to invest in your project was that you invest in your own project. Um, every single investment, that's number 11. Are, are they investing in their own capital in the deal? That for me is critical. And let me take you back to my first deal. No, those investors, first off, they had never even exited a deal before. So when I say, what are their projections? What are their, they need to have taken deals full cycle for me to truly understand that. So how many deals have they taken full cycle? We've taken, what is it now? Nine something properties, full cycle, maybe even more than that once we're, we're literally about to close on a couple, but before those ones closed, nine deals full cycle. Out of those nine, there's been projections that we put up front there's been return, per, you know, and then actual numbers that we hit when we exit. And those far exceed our returns, far exceed. If you don't know our track record, we can certainly send that over too, but they far exceed for a lot of the reasons that we just talked about. But number 11 is also one of those reasons. Okay, are they investing into their own deal? My first deal that I invested in, they were not investing into that deal. Why? Well, because they were brand spanking new into the space. Everyone on the team, brand spanking new into the space, and they didn't have the capital to invest. Well, okay, that's an issue, okay? It's an issue for a number of different reasons. They're just desperate to do a deal. Our biggest problem is not deal flow. 
Our biggest problem is which deals to choose from that deal flow. Why? Well, because we're doing due diligence on all those deals, uh, more detailed than we're going to even walk you through in this four-part series. So I need to know as I'm investing into these deals as a person, as a company, and then also bring it to our investors is that first off, if I'm ever going to bring it to my investors, that's a deal that I need to believe in and want to invest in and actually invest in. So why do we invest in every single one of our deals? Because we believe in every one of those deals. That's why we invest into those deals. That's why we take those deals down as an operating team. And then also, once again, we want to make sure that we're aligned, aligned with our investors, okay? Meaning we're equally yoked. We have skin in the game. That's, that's actually, you know, one of the ways sometimes I'll ask the question is, are you investing in your own deal? And, or, or I'll ask, hey, what skin do you have in the game? I want to see how they answer that question. Oh, sweat equity, actually. Sweating, sweat equity, lots of it. That's, I need more than sweat, okay? Speaking of sweat, I'm no longer allowed to raise my arms in the air because it is a wreck <laughs> underneath there. I just tell you right now, it's a wreck. It's a wreck. But that's neither here nor there. That's not what you're doing due, due diligence on. Is the how hot is it in here, Jay? Eighty-seven degrees. Eighty-seven degrees. Woo! This is dedication. You know what I'm talking about? This is dedication. I could right here. <laughs> so. Are they investing in their own deals? I need to know those kind of things. Those are some of your questions that you need to be asking these investors. Now, once again, a four-part series. And all those things that we talked about, those six things that will be put together in four different series, are all those things critical? Absolutely. Do all of those things have the power to eliminate your investment altogether? Absolutely, they do. Absolutely. And your number one priority, certainly is to make money, but to certainly not lose money. So, so when I, I'm just, for, I, I shouldn't tell you your number one priority. I'll tell you my number one priority as a passive investor when I go to passively invest is I wanna make money, I do, but I certainly don't wanna lose money. So it's risk aversion first, growth of that capital second. Maybe hand in hand, obviously I wanna grow. I'm never gonna invest into a deal unless I, unless I see the return potential from that deal, right? I see it and I believe in the operators uh, that are operating it. Um, you know, my team included, obviously, but I want to know those kind of things, right? So we need to know those kind of things. And obviously I recommend that you do as much due diligence as possible, as much due diligence as possible. Some of you are ready to invest right now. Some of you, a lot of you have already invested, just seeing the chat and who's here. A lot of you have already invested into our different deals, our fund, other investments, obviously. And some of you are ready to invest right now. And that's great. But my advice is to do as much due diligence as possible to continue to come to go through this four part series, understand what questions to ask and understand what the answers to the questions mean. Right. Like we talked about today. And then also just understand the different parts. So it's our biweekly webinar that we're going to be doing four part series. The next one, part two, will be um, um, on financial analysis. Ryan Woolley is one of the best underwriters looking at the financials that I know. He's my partner for a reason because his, so his background is accounting. He's very good with numbers and that's not necessarily my strong suit. So what did I need to do? I needed to partner with somebody who had that skill set. Who's going to teach you that? Ryan Woolley. He's a wealth of knowledge. That airs on uh, May 25th at 5 p.m. Eastern, if I remember correctly. I'm pretty sure it's 5 p.m. Eastern. Um, so make sure as soon as you get that email that you register uh, for that the second part of the series. May 25th uh, is my anniversary. And though I may stay in an office and, you know, avoid four falls in the Healy Healy for y'all and go, you know, fight fires. I ain't going to fight the fire of not celebrating with my wife because I got to do a webinar. Okay, <laughs> So I ain't going to do it. So Ryan Woolley will do that one. And he is a wealth of knowledge. A lot of you already know who Ryan is too. You already know. So make sure you sign up for that. I want to open it up to some Q&A real quick. Make sure that we answer any questions that y'all have uh, on due diligence. So you can go ahead and type those in the chat or in the Q&A or Q&A section, wherever you'd like. So we do have one question. Um, who, gentleman has interest in becoming an active partner. If that's something that you're interested in, MF Capital Partner, we focus on our passive investors. 
But if you are wanting to be a part of the active side, uh, we can definitely talk to you, share some resources and, and, and obviously help you, guide you on your way. But, but we, you're more than welcome to learn from a passive side as well. I know that we have quite a few investors that do that. All right, Ty, Jean just said, do you typically do a comprehensive lease audit prior to closing, like every other unit? Yeah, no, every unit. So we used to do it, how I got trained. So the answer is yes, but not every other unit. We, how I got trained is to do a third of the leases, to, to audit a third of the leases. But if you think of multifamily investing, one of the unique characteristics of it are the sheer number of leases involved, right? There's tons of leases to these tenants. And that's really, if you think about this, the value of the property is it's valued by the income. It's valued like a true operating business. And those, those leases are contracts that essentially guarantee the income. Now, obviously we know some people don't pay rent, but you understand it helps solidify the income generation. So I want to know, so we do hundred percent lease audit, I guess is my point. We, um, learned that that's another learning lesson that we learned is if, you know, if the management team or the ownership team is trying to hide anything, they'll, they'll hide it. Uh, you know, they'll hide those leases that, uh, you know, the, the problems are on essentially. And so what do we do? We do hundred percent lease audit. And especially in an environment like this, you know, real estate has definitely been performing, but uh, there's a lot of operators that have problems a lot. They've just been, what they've been able to do is they've been able to um, <laughs> hang on because of the market. Now, but I'm telling you right now, those, those problems came to fruition in 2020. We capitalized in 2021, but most of them are, uh, real estate doesn't react like the stock market does in days. It reacts over a year, quarters, but years. So I believe that those true, you know, a lot of those will, will be coming to, a lot of the problems will be coming to light uh, Right now, definitely towards the end of the year, Q4. But to answer your question, 100% lease audit, definitely. So. All right, here's another question for you, Tyler. It sounds like you guys are extremely successful. So why is it that you raise capital? Why don't you take after the or take down these apartments yourself? I love that question. I do um, too. There's a, a number of different reasons and ways that I could go down this. Number one is... I call it a scarcity mentality versus an abundant mentality. A scarcity mentality is this. They believe that there is only so much to go around. And so they try to hoard all the opportunities that they have, meaning they try to do it all on their own. And what happens to that individual is they look at cooperation as competition, like as a threat almost, okay? And that will limit that individual, whether that be a passive or an active investor, it'll limit them, no, not even a question. The other side of that is abundance. Abundance is an utilization, not just accumulation. Accumulation is grabbing as much money and hoarding onto it. Utilization is utilizing that money. So what do I want to do? I want to utilize one of our values is to utilize that money to better the lives of as many people as I possibly can. That comes down to tenant satisfaction. That comes down to investor satisfaction, team member, employee satisfaction, anybody involved, right? And so investors, I, as a passive investor, and this might seem like a cheesy answer, but it's a fact, I'm just telling you, this is me as an individual. I was so grateful when I learned about how to invest in multifamily properties. I literally had no idea it was possible, obviously, until I learned. Nobody knows that it's possible until I learned that it's possible, right? But I was very grateful. And so I wanted to share. The other reason is because it mitigates risk on all fronts, everyone's front, your front as well. If you go in and you put all your capital into one deal, all of your risk is into one deal. If you are also the operator and the one putting in all the capital, literally you have every ounce of risk on the deal. Time investment into the deal, which limits once again, your ability to accumulate money and utilize that money. So why do we do that? Because that's partnerships are how you grow in anything. Anybody that says otherwise does not understand the value of partnerships, delegation. It's like that person that is a one person company because they believe that they can do everything the best. No, they can't. It's teamwork. Your opportunity to invest, our opportunity to also invest, but also grow your investment. Hopefully that answers that question. So, I saw I a couple so. others coming, but I can't, I can't read my chat very well. 
It you was what, yep, it was what was the minimum investment amount. And I did answer that in the chat. I let them know that our minimum right. investment amount is a hundred thousand. Uh, we do have a waiting list for any amounts less than that, but but we our minimum is a hundred thousand. And then I did put the have link in the chat. Have you been an operating partner for any projects that have had a loss? I have not. Uh, not on a multifamily side. On the single family side, I was a, I invested in single family properties before I transitioned to multifamily uh, by myself, by the way. Uh, which means, once again, I'm relying on my knowledge as an, solely my knowledge to flip, to rent, to everything. And that crash happened, and I got burnt in that crash. And those scars are some of the scars that I believe make us as a company, because a, a, a number of us as a company got hit, uh, have scars from the crash. So, yeah, I lost a couple single family homes there and learned a lot of lessons about one of those is to know wh when to buy, how to buy that real estate doesn't just always magically go up in value, that there's, especially single family properties, that there's actually strategy. And then the multifamily side, it's valued like a, more like a true operating business, right? So I immediately realized that I needed to learn the business and learn how to operate a business efficiently and effectively. So, so but no, not, not on the multifamily side, yes, on the single family side. Awesome. Do you want, do you want to take a few more questions or? It's up to you. Is there any more? I'm good either way. So there are a couple, I think we've honestly, the ones that the, the rest of the questions you answered within the, within the webinar. And so we will be sending a copy of this webinar. Uh, it will be emailed to you sometime tomorrow. So if you guys have any uh, additional questions, feel free to reach out to Tasha and myself, and we'd, we'd be more than happy to, to get you taken care of. I saw one more coming from Mike. Do we leverage oh. cost, cost tag studies? Absolutely, we do. Tax advantages and tax benefits is one of the one of the best advantages of multifamily. So absolutely. And this year is the last year to couple that with bonus depreciation, hundred percent bonus depreciation. All right. Awesome. Well, okay. we want to just tell you, let you guys know we're so grateful that you guys joined and spent your Wednesday evening with us. We don't take that lightly. So we're so grateful for you guys. And, and again, please let us know if you have any questions, but don't forget to watch your email for the, the part two of this series, which will be on May 25th. We look forward to seeing you guys and answering even more questions. All right, thanks so much, y'all. Appreciate you guys jumping on. Let us know how we can help. See ya. See you, Gary. See you, guys. See you Jenny. Good to see you. Jean, take care. See you, Joe. Chip, so good to see you. I'm so glad you guys were able to jump on.